Hey guys, I'm super excited to introduce you to Jennifer Duplissis, Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Operations for Lovejoy ISD. Jennifer and I have known each other for a number of years, uh, all the way back to when she was working at Wiley ISD. She utilized owner insight and really embraced what we're trying to accomplish here for our product and understood the value that we bring, bring to school districts. Jennifer, uh, her formal background is uh, really impressive. Jennifer has worked in school business and operations for over 20 years. Prior to joining Lovejoy ISD last summer, she served as chief financial officer for Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD, executive director of operations at Wiley ISD and director of operations for Arlington ISD. She holds a BBA and an MBA from the University of North Texas and a PhD in human resource, uh, resources development from the Solis College of Business at the University of Texas at Tyler. In addition to her extensive experience in budget development and management and other traditional finance functions, she has also been instrumental in Arlington uh, ISD's passage of a $633 million bond and Wiley ISD's passage of a nearly $194 million bond. She was also recently elected vice president of the board of directors for TASBO, the Texas Association of Business School Officials. She is unbelievable powerhouse and so excited to have her join us for the Women in Construction series. All right. So, Jennifer, thank you so much for joining the Owner Insight podcast. As I had mentioned to you, uh, this we're going to have to expand this series. We were calling it Women in Construction, but I think now it's Women in Construction and Finance because you have gone the gamut with your career. But I was super excited you agreed to do this because I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time. And we've worked together for off and on for many years. And I've just, you know, I always smile to see everything that you keep doing to leap forward with your career path. But I'm a really big believer in understanding kind of origin story. So I thought maybe that would be a good place for us to jump off and just kind of get a little, uh, you know, a little appreciation about who you are and kind of how you got to where you're at career wise. Well, thank you, Steve. Likewise, it's always uh, good to see all the things that you've been doing. And and uh, it, it's been a crazy bunch of years. Yes, it <laughs> Sometimes we end up places we wouldn't have necessarily thought. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I think stories like that are always interesting. Um, I I started over 20 years ago on the operation side, and that's um, what I did for schools for a long time. Yeah. Um, did kind of renovation and construction from the the contractor side. Went to work for a large urban district, um, Arlington ISD, and so had lots of lots of schools and lots of things to do there to keep me busy. Um, <laughs> So really enjoyed that. And uh, I think eventually just had kind of done the full full circle, yep. whether from the contractor side or the the owner side um, around all things operations, whether that's maintenance, construction, student nutrition, um, you name it. <laughs> you <laughs> have done it all. My husband laughed when I got student nutrition too. Um, yeah. <laughs> they're like, what else are they going to put on your plate, right? You know, uh, it, but that's the fun of operations is doing doing lots of different things and really being able to support uh, what the schools do. So that's that's always been fun for me. And I think um, eventually trying to find ways that we can maximize what we do in schools. We always have some seem to have some limitation, whether it's our financial resources or our um, people. You know, we, yeah. we're always trying to find people and the right talent to put in the right places. So um, I my educational background was always on the business side. Yeah. Um, and then I decided to go get a, a PhD in human resource development. Because <laughs> you, no, you, you had so much time to do that, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, but I think what I truly realized was understanding that piece was going to be so pivotal yes. uh, to, to having an effective department um, in a school system or any organization really being able to maximize what we do with with people, what we do with our talents every day uh, was so huge. So I thoroughly enjoyed that um, seven year process. <laughs> so it does take a while if you do it while you're working. Yeah. Um, but got to delve into a lot of different things there and then eventually wanted to serve uh, in a greater capacity in a school district. And so really kind of got pushed by some some mentors and people who knew what was needed um, and and really kind of pushed me into the finance arena. So I was blessed to have um, a mentor in Michelle Trungard um, for some time. And so yep. she kind of taught me some things and brought me along. And then um, 
I was able to to work more in a finance capacity for a short period of time where I could really zero in and focus on that because we all know that in operations, it's new every day. There's a lot going on. Um, so I kind of had to step away from it for yeah. a year to really super focus um, on the finance piece. Yep. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to do that. But I missed operations um, so much, yeah. <laughs> more than I thought I would. So, you know, you do something for a long time and then you're not doing it anymore. It just seems odd. So I was really fortunate to come to Lovejoy ISD. And now I have both the finance and the operations side. And I just love it. That's awesome. Well, so I got to ask you, because you you started early on in your career in the construction field. And one of the things that we've been highlighting is, you know, women in construction sort of understanding that path as a career opportunity. What are some lessons that you learned through that process going forward? And then how did you take those lessons to move it into the operational responsibilities that you've had? That's a great question. Um, it, I, it wasn't easy. Uh, yeah. And back back then, <laughs> I'm going to age myself. Um, there wasn't a lot of, there weren't a lot of women, um, frankly, to look up to um, in construction and in operations and in the organization I worked in. In fact, I can remember thinking at one point in time, there was only one female who was a mother Wow. Um, who worked at the organization and she was in business development. And I thought, okay, that's, that's telling. Um, were my interests probably lied a little more in the construction management and operations side. Um, it tended to be business development was where, where females landed. And so it was always a challenge to try to stretch into other areas. And so um, that was just kind of an observation. I was fortunate that I had, um, you know, worked alongside plenty of, of men who never had an issue working uh, with a female. And, and, you know, we would joke about certain things, you know, if we were going to go golfing or shoe shopping, but <laughs> it's always a toss up. Um, but I, I really worked with some amazing people who, you know, never saw that as a barrier. And so I, I very much owe a lot of appreciation um, to those folks. And so when I went to work in Arlington ISD, um, Bob Carlisle hired me um, and I, I'm, I was the only female in that entire department. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's somewhat challenging from the standpoint of you may not always have a lot of people that you can connect with or, you know, ask questions of. And and so you, you kind of have to find your own way. It's probably a little bit different now where there's more, um, you know, associations and groups you can get involved yep. with around finding mentoring opportunities. I know back in the day, um, I was a part of the Association of Energy Engineers and the very first Council of Women and Environmental and Executive Leadership or something like that. We had just started a mentoring program. Yeah. And I was the first mentor because there were like two people Whoa. in the program. <laughs> so you're a trailblazer, no doubt, right? <laughs> it was, you know, sometimes it was challenging. Um, but what I found is if you ask the right questions and you're interested in, in furthering the work of your organization, your department, um, at just getting involved, um, not being afraid to do that is is really important. Um, and then just finding those opportunities to ask questions where you can, if it's not in your organization, um, being open to making connections. Um, I was, it, I, I think more so it's probably, it's not as difficult on the professional side as mm -hmm. it is on the personal side and how yeah. you how you manage those things and balance those things. Yeah, no, that's 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 a really good point. I I think you know one of the things that we've seen, and like you said, I think the industry is changing. I think construction is a really um, you know really strong career path for women that are interested in that, right? And you know one of the conversations we had recently with another guest was, you know, you have to show up and you have to be willing to you know assert yourself in a way that allows you to show, hey, I'm not here, you know, trying to you know in part that I know more or, or, you know, even to a certain degree, no less, but I'm open. I'm an open book. I'm interested in learning as much as I possibly can, but I have something of value to contribute. And I think that's, that's really key for any project team, whether you're a man or a woman to be willing to come in and recognize that you don't know it all. You're not an expert in everything, but you're there to contribute what expertise and experience you do have. And everybody has that sort of thread of genius that they bring to the table. And if you've got the right project leadership team that sort of embraces that and understands it, you know, then you have much more successful project outcomes, right? Absolutely.
Well, so I'm curious. So how, how did you ever pick initially at that first stage construction to go that direction? Was it like something, is there like a family background? Was it just an area in college that you're like, oh, that's something of interest. I mean, I know you being, uh, you know, as well as I do now, you're a problem solver and I could recognize probably early on that you'd be like, okay, there's problems here. I can contribute and add value, but you know, I'm making an assumption. So, you know, what sort of led you down that path? Well, I, I often joke um, with fathers of daughters that um, they should listen to their dad and I can tell them why. Um, <laughs> my dad was an engineer. Um, and so he, you know, when other girls were going to the mall to hang out, he would take yep. me to the wastewater treatment plant so that I could learn how it worked because that was important. Yeah, I needed to go to the, you know, John Amos power plant and see how electricity was made. And I needed to go to the recycling center and learn how that worked. <laughs> so uh, um, my dad taught us a lot um, about all those things. And so I don't think you realize when you, when you kind of grow up with that influence, how you automatically start to think that way. Yep, um, yep. You know, instead of, you know, if I wanted to go to the movies, I had to build a plan and engineer it essentially. <laughs> and it had to be approved by, you know, a couple of layers of uh, parent, parental management. Right. right. <laughs> yep. Um, and I mean, he, he would send me out into the, the driveway with a computer and a screwdriver and let me go to town. Um, oh, wow. So, we, you know, I, looking back, I never thought that's that you know, much of that or what that would lead to. And so I, and he wanted me to go into engineering school and I refused. I wanted nothing to do with that. So I went and got a business degree. <laughs> um, <laughs> so he likes to rub that in a lot that I, I yeah. completely wasted my time. I could have gotten an engineering degree. Yeah. Um, but I think sometimes just those natural talents or natural ways of thinking that you've trained yourself in kind of come out and come back and you start to see the thread of how that, how that makes sense. Um, so I had a coming out of college, I had a offer to go to work for a marketing research firm that I had been working for that I really enjoyed. And then I had this other offer that was different. Um, and I thought, you know what, I, I like doing different things every day. I like being yeah. in an active environment. I like problem solving. Um, and I thought this, this is the unknown, but it's an opportunity to continue to learn and grow. Whereas this other, I, I kind of know what I'll be doing for the next 20 or 30 years and it, it's yep. probably not going to change a great deal. Um, and I was just so, um, you know, excited about the opportunity to try different things, go different places, um, solve different problems. Um, so I've really, really enjoyed it. That's awesome. Well, so give, give, um, our audience just a little bit of a feel for what your, your job today entails and sort of, you know, how, how is it different being the CFO or COO, you know, than you know, like in a school district, as opposed to a corporation in your opinion? That's a good question. I think being in a, in an organization like Lovejoy ISD, we kind of have to be a, a Swiss army knife. We have to be yeah. able to do lots of different things and and um, certainly once you're kind of at a executive leadership or cabinet level position in any organization, there are going to be areas that you're over that, you know, there's going to be areas that, you know, like the back of your hand, yeah. and maybe, you know, too much because you still got to work with people who are really doing the day to day in that area. And then there are going to be areas that you um, don't know as much about. So I think it's um, to me, it's exciting because that cross functional um, ability to me is improved a lot when you've got that kind of coming together of different areas um, as opposed to working kind of in the silo situation. Uh, but it's definitely different, um, you know, in operations, you know, people ask for money a lot. <laughs> All the time. <laughs> I, um, so fortunately, my first experience in school business was in a district that didn't have a lot of money. So yeah. I, I learned to be creative, yeah. uh, but appreciating both sides of, of everything that we do is um, it's just, I think it augments our problem solving ability. Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting because, you know, if you think about it, you know, we, we normally talk about construction on this um, podcast, but really at the end of the day, nothing happens without finance, right? You know, understanding the financial needs, how to budget, how to track, how to, you know, look at those um, and there, there doesn't matter the size of the district, the list of, you know, needs is, is never short. Right. So mm -hmm. how do you balance that? And maybe can you give our audience like a little bit of perspective on how, you know, Texas schools kind of deal with the funding scenarios? Cause there's a lot of challenges there and, and, and you, 
I would think that you got to pull your hair out every, you know, every quarter trying to figure out, okay, how do I maximize the, the, the budget yeah. so that I can, you know, leave those as much money in the classroom as I possibly can, but you have all these operational, you know, uh, expenses that, that come up, not to mention if you're expanding the district or adding to the district in any way. Right. Definitely. And every district has its own challenges. So I've, uh, worked in a few places. My first district was an extremely large urban district um, with limited funds, uh, with a lot of deferred maintenance. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna try to give a few examples. Yeah. Because, because it truly is about understanding what's in the best interest of the district as a whole or your organization as a whole. So looking at um, what I learned real quick in that organization was I had a lot of really great operational ideas. But if I didn't figure out how to make that flow through our CFO, I wasn't getting anywhere. <laughs> She's very smart. Uh, she yeah. taught me a lot. Yeah. But um, I think that that you know that's really a part of understanding the whole picture. If we're just solely functioning on an operational lens and not understanding the financial implications for our organization, then we're going to miss the boat. And anytime we talk about a construction project, what are they going to ask? What's the budget? Yeah. What's the budget? Is it on time? <laughs> Was it on budget? Yep. Um, you know, what What do we have to work with here? So understanding those parameters are huge. In that particular scenario, um, I actually remember working really, really hard and getting a special funding. Um, at the time, it was a specialized bond program. Had got, gone out and gotten an award. At the time, this is, you know, 25 years ago, it was <laughs> $5 million. And I was super yeah. excited about this, yeah. you know, MEP work we were going to do for $5 million. Um, and we ended up not using that funding mechanism because uh, the CFO wasn't comfortable with it. Oh, and it was really low interest money. And I thought, what's going on? Yeah. Um, but I learned that, you know, her function was to protect the district from risk. And so, yeah. you know, really for her, there was a different funding mechanism that we could use. Um, so it, it taught me a lot about really understanding what fits that profile for that organization. How do you dovetail yeah. what you're doing and all the work? Um, later on, when we did a bond program, it was, you know, almost six hundred million dollars and five hundred million of it was deferred MEP work. Um, so trying to figure out how to how do we assess that and how do we phase that and how do we put that into a program so that we can plan for it? Um, I remember when I first started there thinking, there's just so much. There's just so much work that needs to be done. How how are we ever gonna get over? You know, get some trajectory on moving this forward. Um, but really, that planning, that planning piece, and then a lot of times, um, just kind of the gut check. Like we work on things a lot, and we have a lot of planning and a lot of thought processes and a lot of investigation. And sometimes we have to remember to pick up our head and ask the question. Yep. You know, here's what I'm thinking. If I'm looking at this, you know, what are the parameters? What, you know, how do you think that can work or not work? Um, and so kind of really being able to pull that out and ask it. So that was really helpful there. I've also worked in a district that was very um, fast growth. So lots of new construction and all the new construction was lots of classrooms and yeah. <laughs> lots of additional yeah. um, athletic space. And so, um, you know, that scenario is different than you're spending a lot more time trying to understand uh the enrollment projections where is it going to happen when's it going to happen what's the planning around that how do we time our construction and our bond programs um what's our capacity and when you're in fast growth you're going to run up against a certain amount that you can build out before they come but they're coming so you know how do you make that all work together um and so that's kind of a different different focus but enrollment for a school district drives so much of our funding um, that we have to know that piece. And every organization has a different driver, right? But what's the big revenue driver? And understanding that can be really helpful. And then, of course, now I'm in an organization where we're trying to do a lot of financial recovery. Um, so what we're doing here is, is, of course, just every situation is a little bit different. We're looking yeah. for any efficiencies that we can generate. We're not in a growth uh, enrollment growth environment. Um, but fortunately, we have fairly new facilities, so we don't have a lot of aging MEP. So really our our focus um, starting next fiscal year is going to be really around developing a long term capital plan uh, yeah. and really diving into that work. Well, so what do you think, you know, from your perspective, because you've been on kind of both sides of the coin and, you know, there's always the challenge of 
how you get your tax base, right? Your constituents in your district to really understand and appreciate the challenges that the school districts are facing. And, you know, we get an opportunity, obviously, because of, you know, the environments that we've been in with Owner Insight to, you know, explain what we do and why we do it, why we're so passionate about helping school districts. But it's interesting, somebody from outside the bubble, right? Outside of our space, they really don't understand the intricacies and the challenges that you face day to day trying to keep a school district moving forward. Um, they automatically assume that, you know, taxpayer money is being wasted. And, and, you know, what would you say to someone that's like, you know, just really doesn't understand that process as much? What, what would you want them to know about how big a challenge it is for your district or any of the districts you've been affiliated with or, or, or have seen? That's a great point. It's a huge challenge. Um, and I think sometimes we have to work through that um, us versus them mentality. Yeah. Um, I, I remember early on, you know, if, if I had a, a grounds guy run off to, to take scrap metal to the yard, I would get a phone call every single time, you know, is he giving that money back to the district? What's he doing here? Um, because that was kind of an environment where, um, there was a lot of distrust and a lot of fiscal challenges for school districts, um, across the state. And so, you know, people were just really, um, hesitant about anything that was being done. There was, there was a lot of concern. Um, so the good of that is that it, it taught me to be very, um, transparent to, to share things. Um, and probably that is honestly one of the biggest challenges is we're doing the work every day (laughs) and it takes so much to do that. And then also to create the transparency, to share the information, to put things forward, um, but at the end of the day, I truly believe that's that's what our communities deserve. The schools yep. belong to them. Absolutely. Um, and we are we are a part of that. We should feel a part of that community. Um, you know, even if we don't live there, our service is is to the community. And so everything that we do has to focus on that. And I think sometimes, um, you know, it's it's the coming together. Um, one of the things that we've done this year in Lovejoy is a financial sustainability committee. Um, and I've just absolutely, honestly, it's been a long time since I've done a finance committee. I've done a lot more on the operations side lately, but I've been blown away by how many people in the community would come together. We have 40 people who come and sit in evening meetings when they could be doing lots of other things, hashing through what are the options that that we have in front of us um, to improve our financial standing. Um, So that kind of work, it's just, it's hard to describe um what that collaboration and energy creates um and the fact that it's not kind of us versus them or even in in, even within the organization right it's not we're all in this together we're all going to fix it or we're not (laughs) we're not going to be here in a couple years if we don't um so i think that's probably one of the biggest challenges well i think probably your uh your you, I know you to be a, a big student of people and, you know, obviously tying that back to your human resources, education and training and interest is one of the things that you do is try and bring the right people to the table to have a productive conversation. Right. And like you said, you know, a couple of times transparency is really key and being open and willing to have those conversations when they happen. They may not be the most ideal, but people generally you know, oftentimes you know, there are some exceptions to this that complain for no you know, reason other than it's an opportunity to complain. But for the most part, people do it because they have a vested interest in what's happening. And there's a lack of knowledge or a lack of understanding. And so when I have a school leader like yourself that's willing to come to the table, be transparent, have that conversation and involve them in the, the process or at least give them a path to say, look, come come see what we're doing. Here's this committee or here's this opportunity to come learn about what we're doing. And we want to take in that input, you know, you know, want to certainly take in great ideas because we, you know, we're open to that, I think is really key. We, we visited a school district in rural Kansas um, a few months back. And it's really interesting because they, uh, you know, that really small district, they're in buildings that are a hundred years old. They're trying to figure out how to make things work. And their superintendent, you know, prior to a big wrestling match was, you know, their, their toilets backed up. So they had raw sewage going through their, you know, facility literally hours before the, you know, the, the crowd was coming for this meet. And there he was and his assistant superintendent and the CFO and everybody's in, you know, mocking, mopping stuff up and and trying to get things back. And nobody sees that. And, you know, it's one of those things that's really 
you know, really challenging for them. And they had just failed a bond because they, there was just this not enough support for what they need and they really need it. And it was kind of interesting. One of the guys that was in the meeting said, you know, I think we really have to help these folks, the constituents understand you're either going to be an owner in the district or you're going to be a renter, you know, and owners require that you come to the table, not just to complain, but you come with some ideas and solutions. And that's what prompts the conversation, right? So, you know, I would suspect in operations and in the finance challenges that, you know, you've experienced in your career, um, you know, you're really good at helping people make sure that they're, they feel like they're heard and understood and, and have a, a part in the planning process. Yeah, that, that's, that's a great point. And honestly, seeing what's in, you know, seeing the facility, seeing what's in the buildings, a lot of our constituents will never enter yeah. a, a school. Um, and if they do, they may see, you know, one classroom twice a year. You know, fortunately, we do have very involved um, community members in Lovejoy, but that's not always the case. And so um, I, I remember many years ago standing on the roof before a board meeting um, in a school district in East Texas. And uh, they asked at the last minute to go to the roof with the board members before the board meeting because they we were going to replace the roof and several other items and and they wanted to see what it looked like and I was wasn't really planning for that so I was wearing high heels <laughs> it was a board meeting yeah so I, I I did learn to keep a second pair of shoes in my car because I got to the roof and. Um, swiftly punctured a hole into the <laughs> with a high heel. Um, I mean, you illustrated the point of why it needed to be repaired just very saying, well. Um, yeah. Just saying, not, not a fan of that type of roof. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, this is why hopefully this gets approved tonight. Um, and it did. So everything was fine. Uh, but yeah, some of those things you know, people don't realize, you know, the cost really MEP work is expensive Yeah, um, and it's yeah. invisible. So, you know, they, they don't, it's not a, a pretty new building. And that was one of the big challenges with, with the, the big amount of work um, when you have lots of aging infrastructure, you know, until it's running down the hallway, <laughs> yeah. literally um, not everybody understands the, the, the cost of the invisible. Yep. Well, I mean, it was an unintended consequence, but I mean, essentially you took a show and tell to a completely new level, right? <laughs> right. Well, you know, it, it kind of brings up a point, you know, with the economic situation, the way that the way that it is now, right? You know, 40 year high on inflation, all the challenges with supply chain. How is that going to impact your school district? And what are you seeing and hearing around the state for other districts about what that's going to do to helping manage those you know, ongoing maintenance projects, those refreshes of schools, the new construction that's going to go on. I mean, what are the big challenges that you think, you know, the districts are going to face? That's a good question, because I think a lot of the support that we've seen around um, things like BATREs and bond elections recently um, is so contingent on that that piece of uh, really buying into what the district needs and what they would move forward with. Um, so I think, um, and this is completely projection, but as we start to see our, anybody got their tax, uh, appraisal yet? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so in Collin County where we're situated in the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, those values are just shooting through the roof. Um, and so it's, it's, it's hard, um, for property owners, you know, your, your single home, single family homes to really stomach the fact that their their values are increasing that much um so you know with with the talk of interest rates and so forth people just become start to become a little bit more concerned yeah um i think the good news is from from a school district perspective we're um you know we're cat our homeowners are capped at a 10 percent you know increase in their their home values so and then we're talking about in may having the increase in the, the homestead exemption um so in a lot of ways for an example, for us, the increase in that homestead ex exemption on the school district side of $40,000 will actually kind of net out if we do a VATRE uh, for homeowners, but they're still going to experience that property value increase and and hear the things about interest rates and the slowing, potential slowing of the housing market. Um, it, I think one of the, the things that will challenge some of the faster growth districts is to demographic projections right now are just all over the board. <laughs> so it's just really hard. Uh, 
<laughs> so we we used to look at these charts for years and go, okay, we'll pick. There's low, mid, high. Pick the mid and let's yeah. move we'll, along. Fill it will be good, board. right? And we'll be good with that most of the time, right? Right. Um, yeah. And we've really had to reevaluate that. I, I, you know, I don't think many districts have seen the full recovery um, in terms of enrollment. And then compounding that, if they haven't, most districts have not seen a full recovery from enrollment perspective. You know, when people found their other ways. Um, you know, to proceed with their education, some didn't come back. So, I mean, definitely the majority have, but I think that's a challenge is trying to project what we're going to have from that perspective. And then uh, the construction market, what's it going to do? Um, yep. So a lot of districts are going to have a lot of big pivots that their community might not expect. And that's yeah. always hard is when you've been talking about doing X, Y, Z, and all of a sudden the projections are different and you have to adjust to that. Um, that's always a difficult conversation to have. But we we talk a lot about um, what that means and what the assumptions are that we're building into our models um, for anything, whether it's evaluating our, um, you know, out, out of districts transfer program, evaluating our transportation department, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, we have to share what are the building blocks of how we've calculated that um, so that when there are adjustments, people are kind of understand yeah, um, yeah. what's happened. But it's going to be real interesting to see what that net effect is. Now on the construction cost side, I mean, I feel like we've seen a lot of it already. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost not new at this point. Um, and hopefully districts have gotten to the point where they can plan in some yeah. way um, appropriately um, and, and have kind of looked at what what our inflation looks like. What, the, what do you want to build if you have a multi-year program? You've got to have something built in. Um, yeah. you know, to plan for that. So, well, you know, and the challenges and you, you, you are personally responsible for playing a really big role in, in passing nearly a billion dollars worth of bonds. Right. So you've been through that process, you understand it and clearly bring, you know, some strong value to the overall process. The interesting thing was last November, you know, it was kind of a historical, you know, bond uh, season where a lot of school districts that really had, you know, a lot of things out there in terms of needs, especially a lot of fast growth districts, they saw kind of an overwhelming, you know, vote no at the at the polls. Do you think that trend continues? Do you think that was kind of tied to, you know, a lot of the uncertainty and frustration with, you know, the pandemic and the potential ramifications of how that was affecting supply chain and in some of those, you know, other uh, those other construction costs or, you know, do we have a new trend that's starting? I mean, it's, it was the largest, you know, defeat in two decades, right. And in, in the vast majority of those uh, school districts. So how do you think the districts respond going forward in that regard? That's a great question. It's funny because when you say that, I, I remember two decades ago when, <laughs> when it was you were really 10, hard, but you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> to pass a bond. So, you know, we've been through this before. Um, yep as school districts as in the state having difficulty. And and really, if we think back to, to what it was like back then, um, we didn't pass huge bond issues. They were, you know, smaller, more incremental. And yeah. so that may be a change that we see is, is this long term, longer term approach because of the uncertainty. It's possible that we see smaller, um, more strategic bond uh, referendums going forward. And I also think that one of the things that was you know, depending on how you evaluate the bond election results, a lot of them were, um, you know, multi-prop. And so the props that didn't pass were the ones that were related to athletics yeah. or yeah. fine arts or specialized facilities. So when the legislature required that we split that out in a separate prop, that's what really had a huge impact. Not being able to single prop a lot of that together, I think, had a more significant impact than some communities realized. Um, and so it's putting that under a, a different magnifying glass. Um, and we all know from the construction side, I can build a classroom a lot cheaper than I can build, a, you know, a gym. I mean, yeah. that's just, you know that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah. a completely different type of construction. Uh, but when you say, like, like you said before, if you have a, the random community member looks up and goes, good gosh you know, 20% of this bond is, you know, for these other facilities, these aren't classrooms, why do we need this? Um, and that's where that piece comes about of there's a lot more work that has to be done on the front end of understanding what what makes a student successful. Yeah, really. Um, and and it's not just it is a lot of what happens in the classroom, obviously. 
But what makes a student successful has a lot to do with other programs as well. Um, you know, their involvement in athletics, their involvement in fine arts, you know, are, are those important? That's a, that's a conversation that needs to be had with the community. And if they are important, you know, what facilities are actually needed? Are we going over the top? Are we building the Taj Mahal? Um, you know, if that's what the community wants, great. But, you know, can you also look at it from the approach of what's important? So as an example, um, if we're talking about a large gym space for high schools, that that is generally, a, you know, one of those topics that comes up. Well, how yeah. important is it that you have your entire student body in one place? Ooh. So that's something people don't think about. Yeah, yeah. You know, are, are you intending to, is that important? Is it not? Are you going to rent another space? Do you have the availability to do that? Or is it important that you have that somewhere in your district? You know, some of those conversations, as simple as they are, they just, I, I feel like um, they kind of, there's pockets and pieces that get discussed, but um, not always is the full kind of conversation around the whole student. I mean, that's what we're graduating. We're not graduating brains. Right, that's <laughs> um, right. We're, we're graduating whole people. Um, and so what the community wants to see out of their graduates, I think is an important part of that conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's a really good point. You know, I know obviously in your role today, but pretty much, you know, in every position that you've had, you, you've been very focused on risk management and you know, how critical and essential that is to any organization, but especially for school districts, because you've got to be the good steward of the taxpayer dollar, right? So how did how did you go about, um, you know, how do you go about now and, and maybe some of your experience when you were more directly involved in construction, how did you manage that risk when it came up to managing the construction projects for a district? What, what advice might you give another district leader out there that's trying to figure out how to kind of get their footing relative to managing that risk? Risk management is a big topic. Mm -hmm. um, we can do a whole episode on it. <laughs> <laughs> we can go a lot of different ways with that. Yeah. Um, one of the biggest risks, and I'm not just saying this because uh, I'm uh, responsible for finance, <laughs> but one of the biggest risks is financial. Um, yep. And I think that was something new that we'd seen uh, really evolve in the last seven or eight years um, is with the evolution of large bond programs because of this massive student growth that we have in Texas. Um, you know, that, that, that puts us on the radar for yep. people who want to steal up money. Uh, yeah. right. We're, we have large payouts that go out. Um, and we have pretty traditional systems in terms of monitoring things. Um, so I think we know that we, one of the biggest risks we have in our large construction programs is financial. Um, yep. are we ensuring that when we get a payout that it's vetted more than just confirming that that email address is from that person that I know yeah. because it's happened yeah. to me. Yep. I mean, you'll get an email that is, I paid pay up five to that contractor last month. And that person from that email, what appears to be that email address is sending me pay app six. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes that just goes forward with payment and somebody slips in a change of change of depository bank at the same time. Yeah. Um, and that that's a huge risk. So I think, some of our traditional good practices around construction can prevent that. Um, we should be reviewing payoffs with our contractors. We should be looking at them. They shouldn't be rubber stamped, but unfortunately, um, especially with a lot of turnover in school districts and, and things like that, it's just that oversight for owners, I believe, yeah. could be significantly improved. Um, so to me, that's that's a huge part of the risk. Um, and then just from a program perspective, um, managing your expectations of what's happening on the job site and your your timelines and, um, you know, what's in your contracts and what's not. Uh, that's that's a huge part of it. Um, yeah. The community builds their expectations around, you know, any given construction program and when they think it's going to come about. Um, and so that's something that constantly has to be uh, managed and communicated in terms of updates and there's so much that goes on in school district board meetings that, you know, oftentimes we do what we do in the background, uh, but it really is important to bring everybody along and kind of share what's happening, what's what's being seen. Um, and there's some very creative ways to do that. Um, you know, I can't say that doing doing a video is my favorite <laughs> way to share a construction update. Yeah, uh, I'm old school. I, I like all the reports and the financials. and. Yeah. The, the schedule update. Um, but a lot of times, 
you know, nobody's people who aren't in the business may not be sitting through that. So you need to have that absolutely and be able to yep. share that because there will be people in your community who are knowledgeable about construction or about um, financial matters. And so they'll want to see that. But you also have to be able to deliver it in a way that's, um, you know, meaningful or, or you know, short kind of um, summaries that people will be able to to grab on to. Yeah, Those absolutely. Are, I think are a couple of the big risks. Um yeah, no, I mean, that that's great. I mean, you know, one of the things that we try and, you know, focus on with our software is to provide the district with those tools in order to better account for those things, hold people, you know, accountable, have the transparency across the process. And uh, like you said, the financial aspect is one of the biggest factors, right? You know, making sure you're, you've got things that are, are properly documented and tracked, but there's the detail that you need in order to support yourself, whether it just be to ask the questions or you may need that information later on for, you know, something that bubbles up in the project or if things get off track and you have to pursue action against one of the stakeholders, you, you need, as a district, you need to be able to have control of that information and not be beholden to somebody else's software or just what was shared to you via email. Right. So Absolutely. that's one of the keys. So what, you know, switching gears just a little bit, because you, you have such a wide diverse level of experience. What advice would you give to other females that might be thinking about sort of a similar career path, whether it be in construction, whether it be in finance, you know, what, what are, you know, what would be some of the mentor advice that you would give to those, um, those, you know, women that are, are curious about this and are like, I just, I don't know what, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So, you know, what, what, what would you tell them to, you know, I, I know you mentioned earlier, find and surround yourself with some great quality people that believe in you and support you, but any other tips that you might like to share strategies that you might like to, to offer up? Absolutely. I, you know, I've had some interesting conversations with a colleague over the last couple of months. And one of the things that we've talked about is, um, what, what it looks like from the outside versus what it looks like from the inside. Um, yeah, like and that. the amount of work and learning and hard grinding it out that it takes, um to really advance what you're doing in your career regardless of what it is um it is something that's often not seen uh but i think is it can be very underestimated so it it's i think asking the questions and and i always say never stop learning um yeah. that's a quote i picked up from one of my assistant directors who was phenomenal uh but really there's there's always something to learn or improve upon you know if you mess up that's okay what are you going to do differently yeah. You know, find out what find out what went wrong, fix it and then improve on it. Um, and so I think the fearlessness to do that, uh, to to continually fix things and improve things, um, find out what we can do differently and ask the questions and just never stop learning. Um, I think there's so much out there and so much available, especially now. Um, but it really is incumbent upon the individual. Right. To decide yeah. that okay, I'm going to go figure out how I need to do this. And I'm going to ask the right questions and, um, and seek the best, best information that I can. Um, I think that's, that's probably one of the most significant impacts. Um, and that can come from any, any direction. Um, there's, you know, I've been involved in a few associations and, and that's helped a lot. Um, but it's, it's whatever works, you know, whatever gives you the opportunity to investigate things. Um, is definitely going to be beneficial. Well, and like you, I think one, you know, one uh, piece that I think people could take away from you and your, your journey has been, you may have been down one specific career path, but you kept an eye open for other avenues where you could, you know, get that experience. You could ask those questions. You could explore, you know, other avenues that you could contribute because you had those interests, obviously, you know, in, in human resources and understanding the dynamics of, of you know, human behavior to, you know, to, to build and, and create better team environments, whether it be on the construction side or in the finance or operations side, and looking towards, you know, the finance side where you can, you know, take some of that educational experience and that problem solving that you're so well known for and saying, okay, how do I adapt this so that I can fit it here? And, you know, you've, you've kind of, you're a perfect example of someone that has really taken the reins of their career and said, Hey, look, well, what about this? <laughs> let me go try and learn this. Let me go experience that. And, you know, let me see what, you know, I can bring to the table, you know, because I've got something to say and I've got something to teach and, and I still have something to learn, but at the end of the day, I bring value to the table. 
Well, thank you. That's the, you know, I've been very fortunate to have people to ask questions along the way too, where, I mean, there have definitely been times I've picked up the phone and said, I, I feel like there's something else, but I don't know what it is. And I'll be honest, I've, I've told many people this finance is not where I thought I would end up. Um, and, but it is a perfect fit for me. Yep. Um, and I think that's just those steps that you have to go through, right? The steps in your career, you have to go through to e explore different things. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you never know what you're going to end up doing, right, Steve? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly <laughs> right. I remember one of the school district leaders when you and I first uh, started working together when you were over at Wiley ISD uh, had said, once you meet her, you will just, you'll love her because she is just so great to collaborate with and to engage and you are, you live up to that reputation really, really well. People, people have a very high opinion of you and, and you're well-respected in every level, I think, uh, within an organization, which is, which is fantastic, but that's a real tribute to you. And obviously the, you know, the, the daughter, your parents raised and making your, you know, you're having your dad go out in the uh, driveway with the laptop and a screwdriver apparently worked out. <laughs> Something, something yeah. worked out about that. <laughs> well, so as we as we wrap this up, I just want to say, you know, I'm so grateful. And, you know, we certainly have been really blessed to know you and, and to learn from you and to have the opportunity to, you know, sort of be a part of watching you and your journey kind of evolve. It's been great to see. But any last, you know, little bits of, um, you know, advice or guidance that you might want to give to, you know, anybody out there that, you know, just wants to understand or appreciate kind of the value that, you know, you can contribute at a school district like you have. Um, any Anything else you'd want to share with us? Um, I, I think just one of the things that's very telling to me is to get, get around a really good leader. Um, and that's one of the things that I, um, I really appreciate about my superintendent, Katie Cordell, and some of the people I've worked with um, in my career at different periods of time is, um, you know, I, I always want to improve and I want to be around people who are going to challenge me. And, you know, we're just going to be able to come around working together towards something that's worthwhile. Um, and so, you know, whatever that looks like, if it's within your organization or without, you know, however you can tap in to a really good leader um, is a great way to kind of leapfrog some of your learning and really challenge some of the areas that even in our own organization, sometimes we don't, you know, challenge each other because we, you know, want to have a cordial relationship and, and uh, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, but get around somebody who's not afraid to tell you um, blind spots, things you need to work on, somebody that inspires you. Um, I think that's been a, a real blessing for me. I, I often joke that, you know, I'm a turtle on a fence post. I didn't get here by myself. <laughs> um, it's Cajun, you know, yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but nobody gets there by themselves, right? That's we've right. all learned from our different experiences and the things we've exposed ourselves to. So hopefully, you know, everybody's able to find that, that avenue, um, for that inspiration and motivation. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things that you've done and are well known for is that you've taken what you've learned from other leaders, adapted it for your leadership style, and then you contribute and give back to anyone who's willing to learn from you. And you have a, a fan base that's huge. So, I mean, keep it up. I'm so grateful to have you on the Owner Insight podcast. I mean, thank you for being here. And, um, you know, we just really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. All right. Well, thanks again. Um, we'll be back with another episode of the Owner Insight podcast very soon. Thanks for joining us.